You know what's crazy about the Scott LaRock story I'm about to do? This is the first tragedy in the game of hip hop. His death was the first murder in hip hop. Now, Scott LaRock, a straight genius. This was a guy way ahead of his time. I'm talking about this man was a smart college educated with a degree business type of man right here. He knew about marketing, promotion, publishing, and how to brand yourself, how to brand your company and everything. I'm saying I'm saying this because look, this was a young black man in the early 80s doing business with powerful white execs and record companies that they couldn't pull a fast one over him because he knew what he was doing in business. Music mogul Chris Lighty, rest in peace to Chris Lighty, once said Scott would have been Puff before Puff, but without the dancing. He was Chris Lighty's idol. Legendary DJ Red Alert said he was just a smooth, approachable brother that could relate to any type of person that that's why people gravitated to him. But see, his life, though, man, it, his life would end so tragic. And, and, you know, some people that was close to him say that he was actually assassinated to get him out of the way of the music business. Hmm. So let's get into his story, though, right? Let's go. Here we go. Now, see, Scott LaRock was raised in the Bronx, New York, which is the birthplace of hip hop. Now, by the age of four years old, his parents separated and his mother raised him and his brother. And growing up, now Scott, Scott always wanted to help people. Even though he was poor himself, he would still give food to his friends in the neighborhood who was hungry. He was always trying to help them. That's just the kind of person he was. Now, around the age of 12 years old, he was introduced to hip hop after seeing legendary pioneer DJ Cool Hurt DJing in Cedar Park and he instantly he fell right in love with music he loved how everybody was having a good time partying to the music and everything it's crazy because he was actually he actually saw Cool Hurt getting electricity from the lamppost to play his sound system in the park wow this is where hip hop started y'all that's crazy and he was there at the time hip hop was at the early stages in the Bronx. But see, also around that time, right, the streets was crazy out there with gangs, drug addicts, stick up kids, shootouts, and everything going on in New York City at the time, Bronx and everything. And by junior high school, that's when his mother wanted to keep him out of the streets. So she thought playing sports would keep him busy. And that's when he fell in love with basketball. And look, he was a star. He was a superstar player at the high school playing basketball because he was like 6'3 in height. And that led to him dominating the courts. Plus, he was the captain of the team. But see, it was hip-hop, though. He fell in love with hip-hop. He just loved music so much that he wanted to become a DJ after seeing DJ Cool Hurt rock parties in the neighborhood. And once his grandfather got him some turntables... And he became good. He started DJing, called himself Scott LaRock, in which he got that name from the rapper Coke LaRock, who was DJ Cool Herc's right hand man. And look, Coke LaRock, they say he's responsible for the setup of a DJ and an MC rocking a party together. And you know what else? Coke LaRock is also considered the first ever rapper MC. Wow, that's history, y'all. But anyway, right now, after that, right, 1980 came around. Scott graduated from high school, and he ended up getting a full scholarship to play basketball at Castleton State College, which was in the state of Vermont. Now, see, this college was predominantly white, and it was a real quiet school, and he liked that. And he ended up becoming team captain on that basketball team there. Now, he also DJed while he was in college. He DJed for the college radio station, too. 
introducing hip hop to the white students. And once he started DJing for a bar called Dugan's on the weekends, his popularity grew. And, and the white kids in town loved it and would party like crazy when he was spin. I mean, they say the place was so jam packed. They say people would stand outside in lines in the freezing cold trying to get in. Wow, y'all know Vermont, state of Vermont gets cold in the winter. He had the college on lock. And look, they couldn't get enough of him. Those white students wanted to learn everything about hip hop during that time. And that's when Scott started bringing his friends from back home to perform graffiti, show them how to break dance at all the events they had in town and everything. Now, one of his friends, right, that Scott used to bring with him to Vermont um, to the shows to show kids how to break dance was Darren Henson, who y'all probably know from the movie Stump the Yard. And he was in the Soul Food series too, the Soul Food series. But people don't know that. They don't know that he got his start with Scott LaRock when he was like 14 years old. But anyway, look, now realizing and understanding the power of hip hop, right? Scott ended up graduating with a business administration degree and he was offered a contract to play basketball overseas too because his senior year at that college he led the team to a 26 and 2 record but he just wasn't interested in playing basketball overseas in Europe he wanted to go to the NBA so that dream was crushed and he just decided to just focus on music because he knew Scott knew that hip hop was about to take over the world. And by this time, it was like 1984 and he wanted to be a part of it. Now, after graduating college, right, he came back home to the Bronx and he got a job as a social worker and started working at a homeless shelter called the Franklin Armory Men's Shelter. But on the weekends, he was still DJ in clubs. But see, look, at this homeless shelter, right, he ended up meeting KRS-One, who was living there at the time. And in the beginning, when they first met, they didn't get along because that was a rough homeless shelter full of men. It was full of drug addicts, ex-convicts, young teens fresh off the streets and everything. And and the work there, you had to be a person that didn't take nothing from nobody because see, Scott, <laughs> Scott, they used to think they thought he was a nerd because he would come to work with a briefcase, short sleeve shirt on with a tie, always wearing jeans, white pair of Nikes on, waves in his hair, always smiling. But he won't no joke, though. He ain't play no games. And how he met Karis one right. See, him and Karis one had bumped heads over a meal ticket and some subway tokens that the shelter used to give them every day. But see, Scott told him he needed to get a job first because he knew, Scott knew a lot of those guys in the shelter was selling those subway tokens to buy weed and beer and just live off the system. But later on, though, you know, him and Karis one became real close friends after meeting at said G's house because he had a studio. And the said G I'm talking about now, said G from the Ultra Magnetics with Cool Keith because see him and Scott LaRock grew up together. And when they met at said G's house, <laughs> KRS-One couldn't believe that their social worker was there. And they didn't know he was hip like that. But they became close and Scott, you know, Scott thought KRS-One was very talented because he could draw and do graffiti and he can rap. He thought he was smart. And then once they became friends, you know, Scott used to tell him like, yo, he thought he was very intelligent. He thought he was very knowledgeable with his rhymes and everything. And he took a liking to him. And they became real good friends. Now, as they grew closer, Scott would invite them down to the clubs where he would DJ and let them rap. That's when they formed a group called the Boogie Down Crew. Because you know they was calling the Bronx the Boogie Down Bronx. So they just called themselves the Boogie Down Crew. And also around that time, he had met rapper D-Nice. Now see, D-Nice, he was young. D-Nice, he had a cousin that worked at the homeless shelter too. He was a security guard there. 
and he had brought him some food one day and that's when his cousin introduced him to scott and scott just took a liking to him man he just took him right under his wing and started working with uh d nice now after that right scott scott really wanted to pursue music with krs1 and his crew from the shelter and they ended up getting the deal they got a deal with a label called Zakia Records, calling themselves Scott LaRock and the Celebrity Three, which consisted of KRS One. They had a girl in the group. Her name, she went by the name MC Quality, and two other guys named Levi 167 and Cass. And they did put out a single called Advance. And the song was like a conscious rap song, but it really didn't make any noise or get any airplay so that label let them go out of their contract and soon after that the group the celebrity three they just broke up because all the other members had some issues and that's when scott and karis one they stuck together and they just formed bdp boogie down productions now bdp they ended up with a deal with Fresh Records, which was part of Sleepy Bag Records, because their other friend from the shelter, Just Ice, had just signed with them. But then they ended up losing that deal too after their single, Success is the World, didn't make any noise or get radio play. But right after that, Karis went and Scott was walking one day and they had a newspaper and, and they looked in the newspaper and it said, a label was looking for talent and they called a guy and that's when they met a guy named Jack Allen who signed them to Rock Candy Records and gave them their own label called B-Boy Records as a joint venture only if they would put out a song about saying no to drugs. <laughs> that's crazy too because they wanted them to put out an anti-crack song because see what Scott and KRS won what they didn't know was that label was ran by a bunch of old gangsters and criminals who was tied with Joe Robinson, who y'all all know on Sugar Hill Records. And Joe Robinson, he was tied to the notorious mobster label CEO Morris Levy, who dealt with the mafia and the Genovese family, uh, Vince and the Chen Gigante, them real mafia cats. And y'all don't know him. Check out that Godfather of Harlem series with Forrest Whitaker. You'll know all about him. But that B-Boy Records label that they had just signed to was ran by some criminals. But anyway, right? Now with their own record label, B-Boy Records, KRS-One put out the anti-crack song called Crack Attack. But it really didn't make an impact on the charts. It didn't get no airplay, but... The thing was, they still could put out music when they wanted to. After that, they started working on the album, the demo Criminal Minded. And while working on the album, they ended up meeting DJ Mr. Magic at the studio. Now see, at that time, look, Mr. Magic, probably one of the most powerful DJs besides Red Alert. I want to say he's probably one of the first DJs to play hip hop. But... You know, he was running with Marley Marr and the Juice Crew at the time. That was his crew, which is MC Shan, y'all know Biz Markie, Roxanne, Shantae, Craig G, and all of them. And Scott LaRock and Karis One, they all excited. They met him. They praising him. They like, yo, would you listen to the music? They asking Mr. Magic to listen to their music because they really wanted to be part of the Juice Crew, believe it or not. They really wanted to be down with Mr. Magic because he had the whole hip hop thing locked down. All the rappers wanted to be part of the Juice Crew. But see, when Mr. Magic heard their songs they played for him, he told them straight up in their face that they was whack. <laughs> wow. Mr. Magic was wild. They said he ain't hold his tongue for nothing. But Mr. Magic told them their songs was whack, which made them mad. Uh, I think Marley Mar said he was there. He said that it, that it was so intense that he left. He said he even left the. Uh, he said he even left his uh, music and sounds in the studio. He had to get out there fast. But after Mr. Magic dissed him, right, that's when Karis One said, 
MC Shan was whack. And from there, the beef was on. And that's when they went to the studio, made the song in response to MC Shan's The Bridge song. Karis One and Scott LaRock made South Bronx. And look, now see, look, now at first right, it really wasn't no real beef because Scott brought the South Bronx to Mr. Magic and Marley Mar to play it. And he wanted to be on some seat. Scott LaRock was like, look, we'll diss y'all and then y'all can diss us back like Roxanne Shantae did the Kango and the UTFO and Sparky D them same way they did it and everything so everybody can make money scott was already thinking like that it's the same thing the rappers be doing these days dissing each other to boost record sales and promotion but still be friends scott was already thinking like that back in the 80s he was way ahead of his time but you know mr magic molly ma they they was like nah we don't need you we the juice crew we're already popping so they gave the record they gave the record south bronx to DJ Red Alert. And the people went crazy for the song, especially in the, in the clubs. DJ Red Alert said he had to play the song back to back over and over because the crowd kept chanting the hook. Now, after that, that's when MC Shan came back with the song called Kill That Noise, which people was feeling too. That was a hit too. And once Scott LaRock and Karis one heard that, they went back in the studio and recorded one of the greatest diss songs of all time called The Bridge Is Over. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Wow. And the battle was over. It was over. The Juice Crew never responded. And on March 3rd, 1987, they released the album, Criminal Minded, making it one of the first albums in the gangster rap genre. Never realized that. Because I always thought Ice-T and Schooly D were the first gangster rappers. But anyway, now, the Criminal Minded album, tch, songs like Poetry, 9mm Goes Bang, Super Ho, Criminal Minded, The P is Free. Come on, man. The album cover, come on, the album cover, they had guns on the album cover, a hip hop classic. They say that was the first time an album cover had guns on it. Even though Scott LaRock and Karis One was posing with guns and weapons on the album cover, looking like drug dealers, that really wasn't what they were about though. They was just saying that they was on some modern day Black Panther stuff, revolutionaries. That Criminal Minded album, Rolling Stone even put it on, put it on the list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. The Bridge Is Over, that song became one of the most sampled hip hop songs in hip hop history. After that, right, everything was going good. The album was successful and they started working on a second album titled By All Means Necessary, KRS One. He had he already written the song Self Destruction, Stop the Violence, and My Philosophy and everything. He's working on the second album. But on August 27th, 1987, Scott LaRock was shot and killed. Now, here we go. The story goes. Now see, D nice right, like a year before, keep that in mind. A year before, before this, before they even blew up, Criminal Minded album wasn't even out or anything. They were still trying to get a deal. So, D-Nice had a girl, which was a good friend of his, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't his girlfriend or nothing like that. He wasn't trying to get with her or nothing like that. She was just a good friend of his. So, he called her. So, when he called her, right? The girl's boyfriend ended up getting on the phone thinking D-Nice was trying to get with her. And he tells D-Nice when he sees him, he's going to kill him. So they ended up going back and forth on the phone. Then they hung up and that was that. Now, here we go. A year later, right? The Criminal Minded album is out. 
everybody knows BDP. They done made it big in everybody else's eyes. The songs, the South Bronx, and the bridge is over. Blasting all over the radio and everything. Now, that same girl is telling her boyfriend, like, remember that guy D-Nice that you got into it with on the phone? Well, they big time stars now, which made him even angrier once he heard that. So look, one day, D-Nice and one of his boys were walking and talking in the hood, and all of a sudden, his boy goes down the block to talk to a bunch of other guys that was on a corner, right? Next thing you know, his boy disappears. His boy just disappears. You don't see his boy no more. And the guys on the corner start walking towards D Nice and they surround him, pulling their guns out. And dude that he had got into with on the phone, it was him. So he confronts D Nice, pistol whips him, and then they all run. So D Nice, right? And at that time, he's only like 16 years old, something like that. So he calls Scott LaRock and the whole BDP crew. And he's crying and everything. He, he tells them what happened. Because at that time, they was all at McDonald's. Uh, Scott LaRock and everybody. They was at McDonald's eating with rapper Just Ice when they had got that call from D-Nice because Just Ice had a deal, had that sleeping bag deal, and BDP was supposed to produce uh, his next album. So when D-Nice had called, and Scott LaRock said, we're going to get D-Nice and everything. We're going to check him out, see what happened. But KRS-One and Just Ice, they said they was going to stay. And the rest of the crew left to go get D-Nice. Now, when Scott LaRock picked him up, he told him that he was going to try to find the guys and squash the beef. Because, you know, Scott LaRock was a social worker. He was a peacemaker. He was all about peace and helping people. He didn't want to do none of that violent stuff. So when they went to look for these guys, they didn't even have no guns. He wanted to work it out, squash it, because he knew beef wasn't good. Now riding around in a Jeep looking for these guys that rough D-Nice up. It was who was it? It was Scott LaRock, D-Nice, um, Daryl, also known as the Robocop, who was their bodyguard. They called him Robocop. Their manager, Mo, and DJ McBoo. They was all in the Jeep Wrangler looking for these guys in the projects. And they ended up finding the guy. And Scott LaRock, they squashed the beef. They said that Scott and the guy squashed the beef. But then their bodyguard, Robocop, who was like 6'5", big muscles and everything, he ends up. He gets out the car, ends up getting into it with another guy, and he ends up slamming the guy on the ground. Next thing you know, bullets were coming from everywhere. People were shooting from the bushes, from on top of the roof, and everything. So they all started running back to the Jeep, and somehow they all made it with Robocop driving, and Scott LaRock jumped in the passenger seat, and D Nice and the rest of the guys. We're in the back seat. But the other guys, they, they continued shooting at the car while they hurry off and drove off until they got somewhere safe and everybody started checking each other to see if, if everybody was all right or if anybody was hurt. And that's when D Nice said he saw blood squirting out the back of Scott LaRock's head. And that's when they discovered that Scott was shot twice in the head and in the neck. Mm. <laughs> shaking my head man that's sad man they say scott didn't even know he was shot at first until he complained of being dizzy and he was telling them like why y'all got the music so loud and then all of a sudden he grabbed his neck and then his head just hit the dashboard and that's when they rushed him to the hospital and they say he was conscious when they brought him into the emergency room, but he kept saying he was cold and feeling tired and he went into a coma. And an hour later, man, the doctors pronounced him brain dead. 
and his poor mother had to make the decision to take him off life support. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Shaking my head, man. That's sad. He ended up dying on the operating room. Terrible, man. And she also gave permission for Scott's organs to be donated to the hospital. Now, police did arrest two men. Police did arrest two men named Corey Bain and Kendall Newland and charged them for Scott LaRock's murder. But they were acquitted at the trial because they had no willing witnesses to testify. Now, rapper Just Ice said in an interview that he had ran into one of those guys about seven months or a year later at the club, at the Latin Quarter Club. And the guy must have thought nobody recognized him or something. But they did. And he said, Psh. once they said that's the guy that killed Scott LaRock, that's all it took. And he didn't say any more about that. He didn't say no more about what happened. Now, check this, though. Now, here's the twist. Here we go. This is the twist, though. Now, said G from the Ultra Magnetics and... He also helped produce that Criminal Minded album. He was around them during that time. And he grew up with Scott LaRock. Said G was around. This is what he said. He was around. He didn't get credit for none of the production he did on the album and everything. So he knew how that label was, the B-Boy Records now. Said G said in an interview that the label B-Boy Records that they were signed to, Karis once and Scott LaRock was signed to, that label was run by criminals and they assassinated Scott LaRock. That was the label's plan. Wow. Wow. And doing research on that label, those guys that ran that label, they was in some trouble. They, they, they used that label to front like a pornography type of setup scheme thing. Bootleg and selling records out the back door, all types of stuff. Now, said G says Scott's death was an assassination and here's the reason why now at that time Scott LaRock and BDP had two record deals on the table one with Warner Brother Records and the other was with Jive Records and both of these labels were going to buy them out of their contract with B-Boy Records right now Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, they was offering them less money up front, but then was giving them 100% ownership of their publishing. And for all you artists out there now, publishing is the most important because that's the mailbox money. That's the mailbox money coming to you for the rest of your life. You can give that to your kids. And Scott knew that. He was smart business minded educated he knew that now the other record label jive records was offering more money up front but they wanted all of their publishing and the owners of b-boy records was cool with that because they was criminals anyway running the label and they wanted the money up front plus plus karis one also wanted the money up front you know why because look at the time, he was still homeless. He was living in a... Karis One was living in a freezer that was under the office of B-Boy Records. It was like a garage with a walk-in freezer. And he was sleeping on crates with a mattress made out of clothes and newspapers. Plus, he had to put a brick to stop the door from shutting so he wouldn't suffocate and die if the freezer door closed because two people had already died down there before. Wow, he was doing bad. Look, Karis once said, when the South Bronx and the Bridges Over songs were out, he was still homeless, sleeping on a train, but nobody knew his face because back then the pictures wasn't out. That's why he wanted the money up front too. But see, Scott LaRock was so smart and ahead of his time, he was trying to tell him and convince him that they should just take the Warner Brothers deal, even though it was less money, but they would make more money later on in the long run but after Scott's death 
they ended up signing with Jive Records anyway. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, look, said G also said that Scott Scott squashed the beef with that guy in D Nice. And that that record label, B-Boy Records, paid their bodyguard, Robocop, to make sure an incident happened. Wow. All those bullets flying at them, five people in the Jeep, and two bullets hit the top of the car, only hitting Scott LaRock in the head and in the neck. Sergi said they had a sniper on the roof. Wow. That's crazy. Like I said, Sergi was there. He knew about all the business and everything. So make sure y'all check out that interview Sergi did. And let me know what y'all think. He did one on Vlad TV too. Just, he, he straight up said it. Scott Rock was assassinated. And another thing I want to point out is this. When they took Scott to the hospital and Karis one arrived, he said, now Karis one said he didn't want to, he didn't want to go see him because he didn't want to remember Scott like that. So, which is understandable. A lot of people don't, do, you know, they don't go to funerals. They don't want to see nobody in that kind of shape. They want to remember them smiling and everything, which is understandable. And now, look, MC Search was there. And MC Search from third base, he was there. He said, he asked Karis one like, why did you have a smile on your face when Scott was dying that day? And this is what Karis one told MC Search, right? He said, Scott is in a better place now. And now we're going to win because half the crew is in a spirit realm and the other half of the group is on earth. We can't lose now. Hmm. But you know, after Scott's death though, man, overall it was a shock to the entire hip hop community because he died five months after releasing the Criminal Minded album. And another incident that had happened after Scott LaRock's murder was when a young fan was killed over a gold chain at the Dope Jam tour with Boogie Down Productions and Public Enemy because at the time, their security had quit on tour and they had no security there and that young kid got stabbed in the heart. That incident and Scott's death made Karis one start to uh, stop the violence movement and put out the song Self-Destruction, which was produced by D-Nice and Hank Shockley. And all the proceeds from that song went to the National Urban League. You know, Self-Destruction, that song Stop the Violence actually went number one on Billboard's Hot Rap Singles. And I loved it, man. I love that song, man. It's just seeing all the rappers come together. BDP, MC Light, Kumo D, Dougie Fresh, uh, Heavy D, Public Enemy, all of them. I wonder why rappers don't do that these days, man. They can't, they should get together and do another song like Self Destruction. And just like the West Coast, the West Coast did one too, all in the same game. Uh, N.W.A. Hammer Tone Low, they all got together to stop the violence, man. But I don't know if they're gonna do that these days, though. But you know, another thing, man. D. Nice for years, D. Nice carried that guilt that it was all his fault that Scott LaRock got killed, and he felt Karis One blamed him for his death. And for over 25 years. Karis One didn't speak to uh, D. Nice until years recently, and they're good now, though, but, you know, the Nice always felt that it was his fault, man, that all that happened. Now, Scott LaRock Jr., Scott LaRock's son, he was nine months old when his father was murdered, and he had some choice words about Karis One. And basically, he said, Karis One has done nothing for him ever. Wow. That's crazy, man. I, that's hard to believe. He said his father Scott would have never did that if the situation was reversed. He would have definitely took care of Karis One's family because Scott's share should go to his son. Shaking my head, man. I can't believe that, man. Karis One is worth millions. And Scott LaRock Jr., you know, he said he lived in the projects his whole life, had a very rough childhood, which led to him going to prison and everything. But I know now he's 
He turned out to be a positive guy doing his thing, though. But if Kara Rest went did that, shaking my head, man, that's, that's terrible, man. Scott LaRock Jr. said, D Nice was the only one to stay in contact with him out of all those years. Wow. You know, you can check his interview out on Doggy Diamonds TV. Shouts out to Doggy Diamonds. In May 2017, Scott LaRock was celebrated by having a Bronx Boulevard name in his honor on the intersection of Jerome Avenue and Kingsbridge Boulevard. I'm glad he did that, though. And it's crazy because it's been over 30 plus years since he's passed away. So y'all let me know, man. Y'all let me know, was this death an accident? Was it accidental? Because Scott squashed the beef between D-Nice and that guy. It was his bodyguard who restarted the beef. And they really were shooting at him. But like said G from the Ultra Magnetic said, it was a hit by that record label. They were about to leave. And they had a snipe on the roof. Wow. So, and I, and I guess his death remains unsolved. Because the guys got off. Nobody would testify and the guys just disappeared. Nobody ever seen the guys no more or nothing. So I don't know, man. I just know it's sad, man, and tragic. I hope that uh, Scott LaRock's Jr.'s son could put out that Scott LaRock story, turn it into a movie, because this is the first tragedy in hip-hop. This has to be on the big screen right here. Scott LaRock was only 25 years old. Wow, man. So young in his prime, he would have been a powerhouse in hip hop. 25 years old. Rest in peace, man. Rest in peace, DJ Scott LaRock.